world-class processing starts with our clients and the commitment they provide to their ultimate customers. Our teams thrive on solving challenges to unlock the full potential of resources through our services. Assessment of resource data and project needs to develop tailored solutions. Industry-leading engineering design founded on innovation. Project delivery that gears assets for prime performance. And operations that optimise production outcomes safely, profitably and sustainably. Success starts with truly integrated minerals processing solutions from a team whose passion is to drive global best practice forward. Joining me today, I have Mike Chiricello, President and CEO of Nevada Copper. Mike began his career at Inco in Canada and later joined Phelps Dodge, which was acquired by Freeport McMoran. There he served in a variety of roles in the United States, Chile, the Netherlands, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. In the DRC, Mike served as president of Freeport McMoran Africa. He then joined Glencore in 2014 as head of copper operations in Peru followed by the role of head of copper smelting operations and eventually had the role as head of Glencore's worldwide copper assets. Mike, you've come to Nevada Copper from your role as head of global copper assets at Glencore. What are the key insights you bring to this role as president and CEO of Nevada Copper? Well, Grant, you know, I've been at this for about 30, 30 years now and I've been blessed with some pretty interesting opportunities about, you know, meeting folks, going to different sites, countries, cultures. And, uh, and, and the biggest thing that comes out is everybody wants to do the job right. So that starts off with safety, right? It doesn't matter where you're at. If you're doing the job safe, you're doing it well. So, so that's a value near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and that's coming on board here with, uh, you know, Nevada Copper. They already had it. And now it's just a question of enhancing it. So super there. Uh, the other thing too is that, uh, in my experience, uh, you know, with regards to like a, you know mining ramp up, uh, there's one word that's required or two. It's called patience and perseverance. Um, there's no matter how much you plan for it, which you have to do. There's always some issues that come up, but in the end, with the team working together and safely, uh, you can you know get get your way out of it. And you know that's what we're doing doing now. Some small challenges here and there working with, with ourselves, working with uh, folks like yourselves as well too, to uh, you know, help us to become bigger, better, and stronger. Uh, the other part is that I work, worked on some boards too with uh, you know, Glencore, and uh, this is helping me with our board there too with regards to what they might be thinking, what, what's important for them, and how important it is with regards to my you know, fiduciary duties to all the stakeholders. And uh, I think you know, that kind of sum, sums things up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that, well, that's uh, some good insights there, Mike. Uh, you know, and I guess you know a lot of stakeholders in any any project that or any mine that's you know, being developed. And you know, I think the, the key thing I sort of took away from that is really everybody working together, being a bit patient, and 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 helping each other through what's got to happen to ultimately get it where it's got to go. You know, it's it's not a not a uh, some, no mine or development is really something that one individual can do. It's a team effort and, and we've all got a role to play there, mate. So yeah, some great insights, Mike. Um, I guess moving on, um, can you comment on Nevada Copper's transition from being a, an explorer to a producer? You know, it's always a, a, a quite a big step that, uh, and any lessons learned regarding the development of a, an underground project in particular? Yeah, the, the uh, big switch is going from like, you know, planning and construction type of mindset to actually, you know, producing and longer term, uh, you know, it's two different mindsets, two different groups of people, and, uh, and they're both required. And the uh, challenge is uh, making sure that A, you've got the right team set up at the right time. Earlier is always better, always tough to do. And then two is the whole transition piece. That's always tough. You know, when do you you know, make that dividing line between, okay, now we're producing. I mean, it's never clear 
but you have to start looking at it that way because things change. You have to be a bit more systematic, a bit more like, you know, uh, like, you know, pra pragmatic with regards to, you know, reports, processes, what to look for. And, uh, but in the end, it's people. And uh, we've been lucky to have a great bunch of folks on both sides of the group, on the, you know, planning construction side and on the, you know, production side. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah great. Thanks, Mike. So, I mean, just talking a little bit about Pumpkin Hollow itself, which is your, your mine down in Nevada, can you briefly describe the, the major stages of the mine process value chain at, at the mine site? Absolutely. So being an underground mine, there's like, you know, uh, you know, resource refinement. So let's say you've already found the resource, but now it's resource refinement underground. Then you actually do like, you know, development, sort of like ants going through the hill, uh, you know, drilling, blasting, uh, you know, support development. That's really important, like, you know, support structure, rock mechanics. Uh, then there's the mucking. Uh, then there's the, you know, material handling underground, which usually means uh, bins, conveyors. Uh, then there's, you know, what, what I call the heart of the operation, which is the shaft or the hoist. And, that, and that's what brings folks and material up and down and the ore uh, up. So that's, that's, that's that piece. Then you got the, you know, mill side. So you've got the, you know, crushing, you got the grinding, you've got, you know, flotation, uh, concentrating, dewatering, and then our two products, like, you know, copper concentrate and uh, filtered tails, dry, dry filtered tails. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, so then I, I guess maybe just, um, you know, looking to the future a bit, uh, what, what are the lessons and key things that you're looking to do for Nevada Copper's next development phase? You know, that's what makes this place exciting. You know, I've, I've, I've been, you know, running around the world for a couple of, you know, decades now. And, uh, it, you know, one of, the, one of the reasons I came back here is because for the first time in over 10 years, we have a permitted operating new mine in the United States. So it's not only the underground, but there's the open pit potential. So we have a, a three-pronged look as to where we're going. It's the, uh, so first it's the underground. There's a bunch of resources that are still inferred. So with continued drilling, we believe that those inferred will go to measure than indicated, which will double the life of the underground, which goes from say 15 years now to 25 or 30, which says expansion, right? Expansion mm -hmm. of the underground, expansion of the mill. That's exciting. Then you have the open pit. Uh, there's no open pit yet, but there's a lot of material out there and that's what really makes it you know, like exciting. Uh, it's on permitted ground as well there too. And this open pit would have the capacity to produce roughly 80 to 100,000 tons a year of copper for about 15 to 20 years. Now that was when the price of copper was, you know, less than uh, 350 or 320 a pound. Now with the current market, the way it is, uh, we're going to redo our mine plans and see what that looks like. And then the third leg is some exploration targets on the outside of say the underground and the open pit I just mentioned. Uh, if you walk around the site, you can you know, visually see some blue streaks on the ground. So some nice oxide there. So really exciting. So, so we've got that three pronged attack, the underground expansion of resources, the open pit and exploration targets close by. And, and then any sort of uh, uh, timeline indicators there, Mike, that you think, um, you know, or currently thinking of in terms of those, those next stages of development? Yeah, so, so the current plan is to, uh, uh, like, you know, redo the PFS and, like, you know, refine the, PSS, the PFS, I should say, for the open pit. So that was done back in 2018. You know, now it's high time to redo it again, simply because the price of copper, you know, technologies have changed. And also with regards to uh, a different mindset on how we, you know, would like to run the mine, perhaps, instead of, uh, you know, a two, two phased approach, maybe a one phased approach. So, so that, that could be about, so between that and say starting up the open pit mine, I, like I'd say it's about uh, a bit over three years away before starting the open pit mine, right? Again, funding, you know, has to happen and all that, but just yeah. ballpark figures, right? Uh, for the underground resource delineation, probably about another uh, a year and a half away. Uh, the reason why I say it is that instead of drilling from the top, we're going to be underground already. So the plan is once we get to a certain point, 
we'd like to do some horizontal drilling and that'll tell us really much more precisely where we're at. And then at the same time, we can continue the uh, surface exploration. That can happen, uh, say, uh, as early as the end of uh, this year, if, uh, you know, if everything lines up. So, so that's the general timeline for it. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks for that. So a bit earlier on, you, you, you know, in the, um, uh, in the discussion, you talked about the uh, dry tailings um, process, I guess, at, at Nevada Copper. And um, uh, obviously, you know, that with the expansion plans, uh, it's going to mean uh, a lot more processing um, on the site as well. Can you give us some comments on, on your thoughts, perhaps even on, on dry tailings, you know, how it's being used at, at Pumpkin Hollow, and really what your thoughts are around its increasing application throughout the industry, and, and maybe even things on, you know, your thoughts on, on is there a place for that dry tailings where we can still use wet tailings and placement in various jurisdictions? Interested in your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, this is a a uh, super topic you know i mean we all know about those you know tailings uh, you know disasters that happened years ago and when that happened i was still with the you know glencore and within copper we had over 150 uh, tailings dams that we had to look after right so anywhere between you know eight years old to 80 years old you know so so there's some certain challenges there because they were the traditional uh tailings dam either center center line or you know whatnot uh and we all know the challenges uh with regards to that and having to monitor them and uh, some of the investors uh being led by the church of england uh, you know requesting all the mining companies to you know tell to all the world what are they doing however with dry stack tailings uh that's no longer an issue safety is no longer an issue with dry stack tailings it's basically uh, there's no more water coming out of it, you know, 10% moisture. It has its natural angle of, of like, you know, repose and there's no issues for sloughing or, or coming off. It's, it's, it's really a much safer process. Uh, I will say this as well too. The water savings are a huge factor in a place like, you know, Nevada where we are, I can almost guarantee you that if we did not propose dry stack tailings for the underground, uh, we would not have a mine currently running. We would still be trying to permit a uh, tailings dam with water that would come from who knows where. And then secondly, for the open pit, if we didn't have, uh, you know, proposed a dry stack tailings for that, we would not have a permit. So the open pit is permitted today. If I were to have funds, I could put a shovel today to run the open pit. There is no other mine per permitted in the United States. And that, in my opinion, is simply due to dry stack tailings. Now, having said that, is there room for it in other operations? Absolutely. In fact, I'm, I'm going to go out there and guess that, uh, you know, jurisdictions are going to just demand it. it, it I, I, I don't think it'll be much of an option going forward after, after those, you know, disasters I mentioned uh, years ago uh, from those sites in, like, you know, Brazil. And uh, with regards to water conservation, uh, I'd be surprised if people were given choices going forward. Mm. Yeah, no, look, I, I think and I'm, it's an easy technology. It's a good technology. Yeah. Yep, and and I, and I think there, you know, there's room, like with most things, Mike. I think there's room for improvement in technology, and and typically we, I guess, we find when. Um, you know, industry starts to demand change, then innovation starts to um, certainly improve. And, and I'm sure there'll be a, a lot of improvements in the technologies around, uh, you know, how to actually uh, dewater tailings and, um, you know, uh, other processes, I guess, that we can employ uh, going forward. So, yeah, certainly exciting times in, the, in that space and, uh, you know, look forward to seeing what, what materialises there. Talking about, uh, I guess, innovations and, and the like, I guess one of the other key things that, um, you know, we're, we're all faced with nowadays is, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of move to digital technologies. How, how does Nevada Copper see digital technologies integrating into the mine over the, the coming years? Uh, you know, I see it coming in two, two ways, both at the mill and the underground. And the basic premise is, taking data and making it into actionable information quickly on the spot. 
you know so so for example underground uh, you know maintenance diagnostics for for example having like you know telemetry uh, so that involves to have a like a wi-fi system underground which is another technology but to be able to tell the like you know maintenance conditions of your lhds boulders you know prior to it failing so of course and we all know like you know predictive maintenance if you can do that 92 percent of the time i mean 80 percent of the time would be great but if you can do it in the 90s your uptime is much more you can plan more and it's super safe uh, also like on-demand ventilation with a but with a bunch more data you'd be able to do that and effectively use our ventilation that we have underground on on the surface uh, i uh, see that at the mill especially with regards to like you know grinding optimization and flotation technology looking at the you know, for example, bubble size, bubble color, you know, getting that information right away and digitizing it and helping to make decisions from an analytical perspective of, you know, reagents, RPMs on mills and whatnot, you know, pumping speed, aeration, but to be done instantaneous. I'm excited about this. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a big new field and, and things are changing all the time there. It's hard to keep up sometimes, but, uh, and I'm sure we'll see even at this conference we'll see a lot of a lot of presentations on on digital technologies and what people are doing with that data management as well. So uh, you know, look forward to harnessing that uh, over time. Probably just to wrap up with with, with maybe one last question, uh, Mike, um, around I guess innovative process technologies. Uh, do you see sort of or, or, you know even if you can't see specifically what they may be things areas that you think. Um, some you know innovation in process technologies um, should be to make a real big impact on on future copper projects. I know you mentioned water previously. Is there something maybe in that area that you you can see um, uh, where, where people like us should be really putting our our effort in terms of process? Absolutely, I think uh, you know ore sorting is. Uh, is something you know any it's sort of like a pre-concentration if you will of the you know material even before you maybe crush it beyond a certain size uh help recovery throughput plant plant size that'd be huge uh, that'd be absolutely huge and then maybe as you sort the ore you find another technology to treat this other ore instead of you know discarding it right maybe an atmospheric leach uh you know with regards to more refractory materials as well too but uh that's kind of what I'm thinking, you know, you take your volume, you make the volume smaller, plants more efficient, or you can push more through the same same plant as you would not be able to before. No, great. Well, look, there's some some really good food for thought, and I'm sure everyone's listening to this is uh, making notes on that, Mike. So, look, thank you very much, mate. It's been great great chatting with you and and getting your insights on a, on a number of different topics and uh, all the very best for the uh, future developments at uh, at Pumpkin Hollow. Thanks very much, Mike. And thank you, Grant. It's been an absolute pleasure. All the best. World-class processing starts with our clients and the commitment they provide to their ultimate customers. Our teams thrive on solving challenges to unlock the full potential of resources through our services. Assessment of resource data and project needs to develop tailored solutions. Industry-leading engineering design founded on innovation. Project delivery that gears assets for prime performance. And operations that optimise production outcomes safely, profitably and sustainably. Success starts with truly integrated minerals processing solutions from a team whose passion is to drive global best practice forward.